Hello, I'm Alexander Haltner, and today I'm here to talk about schema thesis and schema-based API testing, a, a technique that allows you to uh, test your APIs based on API schemas. So let's get started then. So with schema-based API testing, uh, as I said, you can uh, automatically generate your tests based on your API schemas. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. So my name is Alexander Haltner, and I'm the founder of Haltner Technologies AB. Uh, I'm a freelance developer, and I also do some consulting, workshops, and uh, enterprise training. So uh, if you're interested in any of that, you can feel free to contact me later. Uh, other than that, all the links in this presentation will be available in the online slides, which are available at slides.com slash Haltner. And uh, you can also find me at LinkedIn as uh, Haltner. Uh, I'm on Twitter as at a Haltner. And you can email me at contact at Haltner.se. So yeah, all the links are in the slides and I all the blue parts here are of course links so uh, if you want to find any of the libraries i mentioned or documentation or the code examples from the demo all those things are available via links in the slides so you can go back and look at those later so quick outline of today's talk i'm gonna have a short introduction to api schemas in case any of you haven't used them before or aren't familiar with them. Then I'm going to discuss some of the problems. I'm going to propose a solution based on property-based testing, and I'm going to show you how schema thesis can make that solution even smoother. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the future and also have a Q&A afterwards. So API schemas then. Uh, API schemas have become very popular as of late. Uh, and uh, today I'm mainly going to focus on a particular type uh, called OpenAPI, which was formerly known as Swagger. Uh, but from, for the newer versions, it's called OpenAPI. And uh, the current version is OpenAPI free. Uh, Swagger is usually a version 2. Uh, and... Uh, uh, it's basically a way to document your, how your API functions and what it does. And uh, there are some different approaches to do this. There are both automatically generated docs based on your models and uh, documentation that you write yourself and which then generate uh, logic in uh, your application runtime. So uh, that's very quick overview of OpenAPI. Then there's GraphQL, which is its own uh, schema and data format and uh, a typed query language uh, where you get all the schema stuff from the get-go. You can't use uh, GraphQL without having the GraphQL schema. So uh, that's also very a good uh, way of having schema-based APIs. This is being worked on in uh, schema thesis at the moment, but it's not as comprehensive as the open API support. So let's talk a little bit about some Python implementations of open API or Swagger. So Swagger uh, still exists, but it's nowadays the user interface for open API. Uh, so there are two main approaches. You have the spec first, where you generate the logic. Uh, the most famous library I know that does this in Python is Connexion by um, Zalando. And then there are the code first uh, approaches uh, where you generate the spec from the code. Uh, this is, is far more popular from what I've seen. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you which is better uh, or worse. I think it depends on your project and your uh, needs. But basically there's lots of tool uh, if you go the code first approach. One I've used lately is FastAPI, but there's several 
uh, Flask extension that does this, uh, like Flask REST X, which was previously known as Flask REST Plus. We have Flasker, and then there's API spec, which is more agnostic and generates uh, your schemas based on Marshmallow models. And for you Django people, there's Django REST framework, uh, which I haven't used myself, but I've linked to their documentation here uh, on how to use uh, API schemas with them. Okay, so then let's continue. Uh, so the problem then, well, of course, it's not always great. Uh, sometimes you have a mismatch between uh, different layers of your application. Maybe the database knows something your application layer doesn't or something in your spec is slightly wrong. There can be a defect in some library you use or maybe there's a human error or just a corner case you haven't thought about. So there are plenty of problems. Uh, and just because you have a schema defining formally how your API should function, doesn't mean that it always does function in that way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some different defects you can see, but this is, of course, just a small suggest, um, selection of what can happen. So there's, of course, a spectrum of defects, as you all know. Not all errors are equal, but it's never good to have them. So um, on the lower severity scale of the spectrum, we have for instance, non-conforming schemas or incorrect schemas. This probably doesn't cause any direct issues uh, or uh, any problems that actually uh, leads to any severe consequences. But it's still a waste of engineering time and it will cost money. It leads to incorrect assumptions about your application. And if you use client generation code, uh, your API clients will have bugs in them as well, or maybe not work at all. So, of course, it's not good to have these problems. And on uh, a slightly higher, but still low severity, uh, we have unhandled errors, uh, which of course looks bad, and it's an inconvenience for whoever encounters them, be it the user or uh, the actual uh, developer implementing the API or using the API. Uh, and of course, it leads to confusion. And in the worst case, it can actually lead to further escalation. And then we have the medium high severity errors, the logic errors. These are, of course, never good and you want to avoid them. Things like data corruption uh, or maybe incorrect behavior in your application. Uh, maybe even crash the entire application, which of course is bad. And something I've seen in some systems handling uh, billing or shopping carts or similar is that you can even reach negative billing or incorrect billing in some corner cases, which maybe you haven't thought about. So that of course is very bad. And then we have security problems, which I'd say always are high to critical severity. Uh, for instance, denial of service attacks, which makes your application unavailable uh, for other users and data leak, maybe um, uh, incorrect uh, implemented endpoint can lead to leakage of data from other users, uh, which of course is bad or your internal data. Authentication bypasses, this is of course never good. Maybe users can access other users' resources or even remote code execution where someone actually can run their own code on your servers. So we can see that there is a lot of things uh, that can happen. And it's very, very hard to think about all the trick corner cases and all the uh, layers and what can happen in between the layers. It's very common to find errors when you go from one layer in your application stack to another. Uh, and even if you have a lot of great unit testing, it doesn't always cover all the way through all your layers. So I'm going to propose a solution today, which is based on property-based testing and uh, using hypothesis. So uh, property-based testing is great at finding corner cases and errors. I'm not going to go into great detail on property-based testing today, as that is isn't the main focus of the talk. But I have another talk on it, uh, which is linked in these slides as well. 
and you can find it on my YouTube channel um, from PyCon Sweden last year. Um, and uh, I'm also going to make a course or I'm making a course on property-based testing. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can always sign up. I also have a link on the last slide about that. But anyway, so uh, with property-based testing, you let the computer do the heavy lifting of creating exhaustive tests and finding all the data to generate and uh, all the corner cases, which you probably would have to spend a lot of time to find otherwise. And in the Python world, Hypothesis is the de facto standard for property-based testing. So um, that's probably what you will be using if you're leaning towards that. Uh, anyway, so a property models the behavior of your code or of your application. So basically, you have a piece of code and you know what kind of input it takes and you know how it should behave given that sort of input. You know what should happen and what probably shouldn't happen. So that's how you define a model uh, or a property. Uh, so to test the application, we need to model all these properties and their input. Uh, but of course, we can do better because we have schemas actually specifying the defined uh, types for the input and uh, how it should behave given that input. So that does sound quite a bit like properties, doesn't it? Of course it does. So uh, we can leverage this uh, using a tool called Schema Thesis, which actually uses these uh, schemas to generate your properties or your tests. Uh, so let's go into schema physics a little bit. Uh, schema physics automatically generates test cases based on what we already know about our application uh, and from the specs we already have, which is great. Uh, and it was created by Dimitri Digalo in mid 2019. Uh, it's very active in development and um, it supports both older Swagger versions as well as the newer Open API schemas. Uh, there is some basic GraphQL support and it's being worked on every day, so it's uh, constantly getting better and uh, hopefully soon it will be as good as the OpenAPI support. But right now there is a PyTest runner in the works for the GraphQL parts and uh, there is some other things being worked on as well. So that is a work in progress, but that is coming. So a little bit more about Schema Physics then. Uh, of course, there have been other similar works, similar libraries, uh, and things that have influenced uh, Schema Physics. Uh, so, Schema Physics is its own standalone library built from scratch, but uh, I like to see it as the spiritual predecessor or uh, successor to Swagger Conformance, uh, which is an older library which, wa which isn't actively developed anymore, but it uh, was my first introduction to this concept and it was built back in 2017 um, and supports older Swagger versions. Uh, sadly, it never reached 1.0 and hasn't been very active, but luckily for us, Schema Physics have uh, taken over and uh, are now leading the way here. So first commit on Schema Physics was made in uh, August 2019. And uh, uh, since then, it's been very fastly developing. Uh, there's also a, a research paper called Quick Rest, which I recommend reading if you find these things interested, uh, Sting. Uh, it came, back, uh, came out back in uh, December this uh, or last year. And uh, it has also helped influence uh, some features and uh, considerations used in Schema Physics as well as uh, showing um, how they actually managed to get similar results with a similar proof of concept. So what do we already know about our application then? Turns out that we do know quite a lot. We know that our application shouldn't crash. We know that the server shouldn't crash. Uh, I mean, uh, and we know that the application should uh, always respond pro properly. We know that if there are stateful links, those should behave in an expected manner. For instance, if we create the resource, we know that we should be able to query it. We know that we should be able to update it. 
and we should be able to get it again and that we should be able to delete it, etc. So we can, of course, use that if that exists. Uh, and uh, oh, a little bit too fast there. And uh, here's some set code as well, explaining uh, some things we can check for. So uh, let's say we get a response and we can check that the status code is under 500 and that the status code we did get is in the set of allowed response codes. We can also check that the content type is an allowed content type for this kind of uh, um, endpoint. And we can also see that the actual content uh, matches the specification. So let's go ahead and uh, try out a demo then. And let's pray to the demo gods that it doesn't go bad. Uh, you never know with these demos, but let's go ahead. So here I have a small code example. This is taken more or less directly from the Restex documentation. It's a to do basic to do application, which lets you CRUD, create, update, read, delete uh, to do's. And I've only done a few small modifications, basically adding some extra logging and stuff like that. Uh, but we're going to use this as our test application for now. This does use Swagger 2.0, so um, uh, some of the newest things aren't supported in Flask Restex. Uh, it will probably be updated at some point. Um, here's my make file. So basically, uh, I'm going to run the test using the HTTP interface. I'm going to talk more about the different approaches later. But basically, I can do I can run schema thesis against the Swagger uh, endpoint for the documentation. But first I need to start the server, uh, run server. And right now I'm just gonna run a simple debugging server. And then I'm gonna run schema thesis uh, against the endpoint at the server. And now we're going to let that run a little bit. And as we can see, it's generating a lot of requests. So a lot of random data being generated, a lot of uh, tests being run. And if we look now, we can see that everything passed and it conformed uh, to the specification. So let's add uh, some modifications and see if it still works as expected. So I'm going to go into my example here and activate some proprietary business logic, which, uh, which allows us to inverse the ID of the to-do. Basically, uh, uh, we want to have the inverse of the ID. And now let's try to run the tests again and see what happens. So we saw something red there, probably some error, yeah, there we got it. So we can see that we got an error in the log and that the tests failed. And if we look at the output, we can see that uh, it's actually using ID zero every time it fails and it fails on every type of request that actually uses an ID. So uh, basically we can see that we found errors we were just introducing into the code base without actually changing our test. And if we look at the traceback here, we can see it's a division by zero problem. So let's just change our logic a little bit and see that we should only use this logic uh, in the case where uh, uh, it isn't zero. And if it is zero, then we will we'll just return zero. And let's uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Just gonna close that. Let's try to run the server again. OK. 
see if uh, ah, id isn't equal zero. Sorry. And there we go. So now I'm going to run the test again. And this time, hopefully, it will pass. So let's wait a little bit. And as you see, it passed. I'm just going to quickly show you uh, as well that you can also import the application directly. So if I space this out a little bit and I run this using the imported application instead, this works with Whiskey and ASCII applications, uh, you can see that no output is being generated here and the logging I added earlier is actually outputting logs here. Uh, normally, probably you wouldn't log this way in your application directly, but this is mainly to just showcase that it's actually running it imported instead of running it directly towards the web server. So that, of course, can be great in some cases. So let's go back then. So the demo worked. Uh, of course, some small things always go wrong, but Overall, it worked good. So uh, let's continue and uh, go into a feature overview. So schema physics can do quite a lot, but there is more coming. But right now, uh, we saw the CLI interface. There is also some GraphQL testing capabilities being worked on. Uh, Built-in Whiskey and ASCII support, which I showed you very quickly. So you can import an app directly, uh, which is great for faster testing. Uh, we have an HTTP interface, which I showed you first, language and framework agnostic, so you can use it with other languages than Python and other frameworks that aren't Whiskey or ASCII compatible, so this is great as well. There's a PyTest interface, so you can create your own uh, properties using PyTest. Stateful testing, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Fix-ups, so there is some uh, fix-ups for errors that are known and you can write your own fix-ups if you find something that's wrong. Uh, one of the built-in uh, fix-ups uh, fixes a uh, Swagger conformance error where uh, uh, Swagger uses a uh, construct from the next version of OpenAPI but isn't in the current spec. Uh, we have hooks, so you can hook on the global test or schema level and customize the behavior of schema thesis through these hooks. Then we have something called targeted uh, property-based testing. Uh, this lets you set the desired goal and have a quicker search path towards that goal, but it uh, will combine it with the randomness of pro property-based testing. Of course, it will reduce the overall randomness, so uh, it's good to find specific things, but uh, maybe not as good to generate very random uh, tests. Then there's the ability to record VCR cassettes uh, with some extra fields as well. Uh, and this is great because you can use it with any VCR compatible uh, software you may already have or tooling. And you can replay the recorded cassettes. So let's talk quickly about the CLI interface, which I showed you before. Uh, there is very good documentation built in as well. So do use the help command for all the commands if you run into a problem. But here's a minimal example. So basically, we can run schema thesis and we put in the endpoint for our, our schema specification and we get some output and we can see that the test passes. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Whiskey interface versus the HTTP interface. Uh, so there's a Whiskey interface as well, uh, uh, which is very useful if you want to do quicker local testing and not run up uh, a full HTTP server and not have all the overhead of that. And here is a small example of that. Uh, so basically, you have the import path instead here under the app flag, and you point to the spec uh, endpoint, and then it works just the same way. And uh, the HTTP interface is, of course, as I said before, framework and language agnostic. So 
You can test any service using that, not just Python. Uh, it could even be COBOL if you do have a schema for it. Uh, probably you don't, but who knows? Um, and basically, I like to use the HTTP interface when I do my testing in CI and for the full system so I can try everything out with all the components and everything that can go wrong between layers and caching and proxy servers and what you may have. So uh, uh, that is good to keep in mind. But for local testing and for just testing your current commit, maybe it's easier and faster to use the HTTP, uh, to use the Whiskey or ASCII interface. Um, yeah, so the PyTest interface then, uh, as I told you before, there is a PyTest interface, which can be used to generate uh, test cases uh, for PyTest, but uh, you can also then define your own properties, your own models for how things should work, your own rules. So these can cover the entire schema or a single endpoint or method if you want. And I previously mentioned uh, built-in checks such as not a server status conformance and uh, content type conformance, as well as response schema conformance. But some suggestions what you can use to extend this could be complex business rules uh, or maybe response time or SLA for your application or maybe authentication uh, behavior. Uh, or for a once, so maybe you want to test that those things work as you expect. Uh, so let's go into an example to show how it could actually look. Uh, so here is from the documentation, an example showing the PyTest interface. Uh, here you can see we actually just recreated the test uh, for no server errors and we run our call towards the endpoint and validate the response and assert that the status code is under 500. But you could do any assertion you would want here. So for instance, you could check that the time is correct or that you have some proprietary ID or something like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's basically it for the PyTest interface. So let's go into stateful testing then. Uh, it's been shown to greatly enhance uh, detection of certain types of defects. And uh, this is detailed in the quick REST research paper as well, and was recently added to schema thesis. Uh, and uh, schema thesis can then reuse the data from previous requests uh, and responses. This will result in tests actually reach much further down in your code base and uh, getting better coverage faster. It does require that you do have links between your objects, which is a feature of OpenAPI 3.0. Uh, it can be used with 2.0 or Swagger, but then you need to use the X-Links extension. So for instance, it will not work with Flask REST X out of the box. And that's also why I didn't showcase any of that in the demo. But if you do have uh, something that do support it, it can look something like this. Uh, so basically you run schema thesis with the stateful links uh, flag. And as you can see, it does a post here. And uh, then it tries to get the user with the same user ID as well as patch it, and uh, then it tries to patch it again. And here you can see that it tries to get the user ID, then patches it, and then you have a patch here, and uh, it does these in sequence using the same user, and that way you can easier get uh, uh, ways to find your actual problems. Uh, otherwise, probably you would get a lot of four fours because if you just randomly generate user IDs, a lot of those will be invalid. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the future of Schema Physics then. Uh, of course, we need help to grow. And uh, some of the things being worked on is uh, GraphQL. Uh, the goal is to be schema standard agnostic in some way. So it can be used with uh, other schema standards or whatever may come in the future. And of course, GraphQL is part of that work uh, and is the first one outside of OpenAPI and Swagger. 
Uh, it's being worked on faster test generation, support for OpenAI API 3.1 when that comes out. It's, it isn't out quite yet. Uh, of course, we want to grow the community, and that's also one of the reasons I'm here talking about it with you today. Uh, and of course, always, we want to improve the documentation so it's easier to use for new users and probably more as well. So I hope you like this and concluding this talk. Uh, basically, it lets you spend less time writing tests, but still cover more. Uh, and you will let your computer do most of the heavy lifting. You will gain some deeper confidence in your uh, services. So you can actually trust that they do work with a very large set of input. Uh, it's actively developed and the community is constantly growing. So that is very fun to see. And I think you should try it out as soon as possible. Uh, so this is it for my talk today. And if you have any further questions, uh, you can ask them to me now, or you can contact me via Twitter or via email, and I'll try to answer you as soon as possible. Uh, I am available for freelance consulting, for training and for workshops. And here is the link I talked about earlier for my hypothesis course, if you're interested in that, as well as my YouTube talk uh, on hypothesis, if you want to deep dive into property-based testing a little bit more. I have a website, haltner.se, where you can contact me. All the slides are on slides.com slash haltner. Uh, and all the code from the demo is in this GitHub repo, as well as uh, my own personal GitHub account, which you can find here as Holtner. Um, and I hope you liked my talk and that uh, you have some great questions for me now. So thank you for coming and thank you for watching my talk. It's been fun. Bye.